Hello and welcome to Friends of Tracking, a series of video tutorials on getting started with data analysis in football. In the previous installment, I provided uh, a, an introduction for working with and visualizing tracking data. Today, we're gonna to delve a little bit deeper into the data and lay some of the foundations for developing more advanced metrics to quantify player and team performance. The basic thing that tracking data gives you is the positions of all the players on the pitch at any given instant. But in many ways, this is only part of the story. Here I've, I've plotted the, um, the player's positions um, at a given instant of the game. Uh, player 20 has uh, possession of the ball. And you know, now that we have the positions of all the players, we can begin to gain an idea of what kind of passing opportunities might have been available to player 20. But the important piece of information that's missing here is where all these players were running at this instant and how quickly. And if I add that information to this plot, you can see that the context in which the pass was made changes um, quite considerably. So these little arrows that come out of each player indicate the direction they were moving uh, and how quickly. The longer the arrow, the, uh, the faster that player was moving. And so you can see that there's a lot of motion from uh, right to left towards the, uh, the red team's goal. This looks like a, a counter-attacking opportunity. Um, and most of the play passes that were available to, to player 20 um, were you know, into the, uh, the opponent's half of the, uh, the pitch. The, the pass that player 20 did actually make was um, to, to player 24. You know, one of the very nice things about the tracking data is that because the positions are measured so frequently, every 40 milliseconds, we can gain a measure not just of players' positions, but also um, a measure of their velocity and acceleration at any given instant. So as I said, the goal of today is to delve a little bit deeper into the tracking data. Uh, we'll first cover some of the, the new functions that we've made available in the repository for making movies from the tracking data. We'll then uh, look at how you measure player um, velocity and finish by creating some bespoke uh, physical performance reports from the tracking data for all the players in one of the team. And as before, all the code can be found in the, uh, the Friends of Tracking uh, GitHub repository at this link here, and the Metrica data set that we'll use today can be found at this link um, down here. So if you want to be able to make movies from the tracking data, you'll need to install a little bit of extra software uh, on top of the basic Anaconda package. If you click on the link, it'll take you to, uh, to this page here in which you can, and you can follow the instructions for installing FFmpeg. So here we are back in Spider. And the first thing that I'm going to show you is how to make uh, movies from the tracking data. The first thing we need to do is just to import some of the modules that we need. As I said, the, all the, the, the modules that I've written for working with the Metrica tracking data can be found on the Friends of Tracking GitHub repository. As before, let's just read in the, uh, the tracking and event data for the sample match number two in the Metrica data, data set. So we'll read in uh, first, let's just read in the data. And as before, we need to convert the, the positions from the Metrica coordinate system, system into meters. I've actually made a small correction to this coordinate transformation since the, the last video. It turns out that Metrica define the origin as being the top left of the field rather than the bottom left. And so I've made a, a corresponding change to the two metric coordinates function to, to reflect that. So let's change the coordinate system. Uh, and one other thing that I'm going to do is also reverse the direction of the, uh, the tracking data such that the home team always shoots from right to left and the away team shoots from left to right. So essentially the teams no longer change halves when um, at the beginning of the second half. And that makes it a little bit easier to analyze player and team performance if they're no longer switching sides halfway through the game. So let's run that.
the function that you use to save a movie from a period of the a game is called save match clip. You can find it in the, the Metrica Viz module. And uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail now. But the way in which you, you run it is to pass in the, the, the tracking data for the home team and the away team and select exactly what frames that you want to, to plot. And so here, I'm plotting uh, frames 73,600 to 73, 74,100, which is around the time that the home team scored their second goal. Um, you also need to pass it a, um, a directory in which to save the movie, which I've forgotten to do. Um, I'm just going to save it to the same data directory that the, uh, the sample data is saved. And then if you run this, it will generate all the images it needs to create the movie and create the movie and save it in that, in that directory. So that takes a few seconds. Um, it's done now. So let's take a look at uh, the movie that it's created. Let's open that and, and run it. And you can see here the, um, the movie that it's created for the, uh, the home team's second goal. So I find that making movies to be a very useful tool when it comes to analyzing tracking data and see what was actually going on at any particular moment of the game. So the next thing I'm going to do is show you how to measure player velocities from the tracking data. If you remember, the tracking data for each team is held in a data frame in which each row shows you the, the positions of each player at a given instant and position observations are made every 40 milliseconds. So I've written a, a module called metrical velocities that contains a function for calculating player velocities. Let's uh, take a look at it now. So the way in which this function works is you pass it the data frame uh, for one of the teams. Then essentially it cycles through all the players in that team and calculates the X and Y components of their velocity separately. And simply all it's doing here is differencing their X and Y positions uh, from one measurement to the next and dividing it by the amount of time that elapsed between those two observations, which in the metrica data is always 40 milliseconds. And so this gives you sort of a rough first estimate of uh, a player velocity. However, we need to do two other things. First of all, we need to throw away uh, outlying values. And secondly, we need to smooth the data a little bit. And so the reason we need to throw away outlying values is there are occasions where a player's position is incorrectly recorded. And it's normally when they're either obscured or for whatever reason have, uh, are not actually in the, uh, the camera image. And when a player's position is suddenly corrected, um, it's going to give a, an anomalously high measure for their speed. And so we want to be able want to remove those instances. So essentially what this does, this function takes in a maximum CV speed parameter. This is in uh, meters per second. It is actually essentially the top speed that Usain Bolt reaches. So if a player's speed exceeds uh, 12 meters per second, then I, I set it to, to nan or not a value. So the second thing that we need to do to the data is to suppress the impact of small position errors or noise in the tracking data on our velocity measures. The way that I do that is to use a savitsky golay filter. Um, this is a function that's part of the, the SciPy signal package. And so you can take a look at that to see how it works. But effectively, what it's doing is a kind of moving average over our raw velocity estimates to make them a little bit less jittery or to smooth them. So to give you an idea of why um, smoothing helps, I've created a couple of little movies. As before, the little arrows indicate the direction and the speed that a player is moving. And in this first movie, I haven't smoothed our velocity estimates at all. And so what you're going to see is there's a fair amount of jitter um, in, in the player velocity measurements. In particular, sort of look at this play here. Let me get this movie started. So you can see that they, they kind of jump around a little bit. Um, and it's, it's all a little bit, bit jerky. So this movie is also playing at, at half speed. So you can 
can see a little bit better what's going on. And so now let's compare that to the smoothed versions. I'll get that playing. And you can see the smoothing has gotten rid of quite a lot of that jitter in our measurements of player velocities. So back in Spider, let's just run these two functions to measure the player velocities for the, the home team and then the away team separately. You see I've set the, uh, the smoothing flag to, to true. And you get this little error here just because the very first measurement of a player's velocity um, right at the beginning of the game is always a NAN because we don't have an observation before that. And so let's have a look at what's actually happened to the data. And what you'll be able to see is that if we scroll to the right, we now have these measurements of player velocity. So here's player 15 and their speed in the X direction and the, uh, and the Y direction. And also we have a measure of their total speed as well. And if we scroll down to the beginning of the match, you can see that all these, start to, all these values start to appear. And they're all measured in, um, in meters per second. And so now that we've measured player velocities, we can create uh, plots that show a player's position, uh, velocity on the field as well as their position. And the way that we do that is to use the plot frame function that you saw in the, in the last video. But this time we set the include player velocities flag to true so that we indicate those little arrows to show where they're moving. And you'll see that I've also added an additional bit of functionality that that writes the player jersey number on the image as well so that we can identify who they are. And so what I'm gonna do now is, is plot a random frame. This is frame 10,000 from the match and run that. And so now you can see that the, the player velocities are, are indicated as well as the, uh, the jersey numbers for the players in each team. So the next thing that we're gonna do is create a, a bespoke physical summary for all the players in the, the home team in this sample game. So specifically what we're going to do is, is calculate some, some simple quantities like how many minutes each player played, um, the total distance covered, and then try to break these down by looking at say, the distance covered when a player was walking, jogging, running, sprinting, um, and focus finally um, on their sprints. So you know, how many sprints per game did each player make and where on the field did these sprints occur? So the first thing that we're going to do is create a new data frame that holds all this information. And so this is what these, these two lines do here. So the first identifies the, the jersey number for each player in the tracking data. And then the second creates a new data frame in which each row is a player rather than an instant in the game. So if I run that now and show you what that looks like. So if we click at home summary, what we see is there's just a single column. We haven't put anything in it where each row now is a player jersey number. So this is going to be player one. And then as we fill this out, the rest of this row will give you some interesting physical quantities for that player. So the first thing we're going to do is simply calculate the, uh, the minutes played for each player in the home team. And the way that we do this is cycle through um, each player's jersey number and, and look for the, the first and the last position measurement we have for each player. So if a player started the game, then they'll have a position measure at the very beginning of the match. And if they were substituted off, then we wouldn't expect to have any more position observations for them from then onwards. So let's run that line of code and see what it looks like. So we go back into the home summary data frame. And now that we see, um, we have a measure of the minutes played for each game, each player. So you can see that the, the first eight players all played the full match, so all played 94 minutes. And then players 10, eight and four were all substituted off. So player 10 played 83 minutes and then was presumably replaced by player 14 who only played 10 minutes. So let's calculate some distance measures for each player in the team. Again, the way this is done is to loop over all the players in the, in the home team and then multiply their speed at any given instant 
by 40 milliseconds, which is the, the time between successive observations, and then sum up that a whole quantity um, should give you the total distance they covered in the game. We divide that by 1,000 to convert to kilometers. So if you run that piece of code, so let's take a look at what that looks like in the home summary data frame. Now you can see that we have distance measures for all the players. Um, player 11 played the whole game, but covered a considerably less distance than his teammates. Clearly, this is the goalkeeper. Although I'm always surprised how far the, dis the, uh, the goalkeeper actually covers. It typically is about five kilometers per match. Um, of course, we can check that by just plotting the player positions at the beginning of the game. We know from looking at the event data that occurs in frame 51. So let's create that plot. Yeah, and of course here again, as we can see, player 11 is indeed the goalkeeper in the home team. You can also very make a simple bar chart of the, uh, the distance covered by each player. So this is what it looks like here. And you can see that players five, six, and seven covered the most distance. If we look back at our starting positions, these correspond to the two central midfielders and the right winger. So let's break that down a little bit further and look at how far each player, the distance each player covered um, at different speeds. We're gonna look at how far they, they covered when they were walking, jogging, running, and sprinting. And I define walking as being when a player is moving at less than two meters per second, jogging when they're moving between two and four meters per second, running between four and seven meters per second, and then sprinting above uh, seven meters per second. And all we need to do here is slice and dice the, uh, the tracking data based on the, uh, the player's speed. So again, we're gonna loop across all the players. So let's run all this piece of code. Um, the last bit here just enters it back into this home summary data frame. Let's see what that looks like. If we open the uh, data frame again in the variable explorer, we can see that now we have four additional columns, each of which show the distances the players covered at different speeds from walking, jogging, running through to sprinting. Let's make a uh, another bar chart out of that. This time it will be a uh, a clustered bar chart. So in this simple image, each bar, each cluster corresponds to one of the players, and then the bars indicate the distance covered at the three, at the four different speeds, from walking in the darkest shade of blue all the way to, to sprinting in the red. And as you might expect, it tends to be the um, midfielders and forwards that do most of the, the higher speed running the, and sprinting, as indicated by the, uh, the pink and, and red bars here. So now let's dig a little bit deeper into the sprints. And in particular, let's first calculate the number of sustained print sprints that each player executed during a game. And I define a sustained sprint as a period of at least one second when a player was exceeding a speed of seven meters per second. So this portion of code here is essentially doing that. It's looping over again, all the players in the home team and then identifying all those periods where each player sustained a speed of seven meters per second for at least one second. Um, so let's run that. And so now we've added an extra column that counts the number of sprints that each player made. So you can see that typically most players made between something like five and eight sprints per match. And then we have one player here, player 10, who made um, 13 sprints. And if we look at the starting lineups again, you can see that player 10 is, is one of the forwards. The last thing I'm going to do is just take a look at where these sprints occurred for player 10 on the pitch. So essentially we're going to plot the trajectories of the player at the moments when he or she was making those sprints. So this last part of code here identifies all the distinct sprints um, that player 10 made during the match, um, and then identifies the frame in the tracking data where each sprint started and ended. 
if we run this um, and then take a quick look at the sprint start, you can see this is a, essentially a list of frames, each of which corresponds to a, um, a period of the period in which the, the player started sprinting and likewise Last variable indicates the uh, the frame in which they ended sprinting. So, for example, the first sprint was from frame sixteen thousand three hundred one to sixteen thousand four hundred thirty six. So, finally, um, let's look at where on the field player ten was making these sprints. Um, this final piece of code just loops through each of the sprints and plots them onto a uh, onto a pitch. Let's see what that looks like. So in this image, uh, the dot indicates where player 10 started the sprint, and then the line indicates the distance covered at a speed of greater than seven uh, meters per second. A lot of the runs are made down the left flank of the field, um, a few of them do the right. There's also a couple of sprints back that are tracking back, presumably to, uh, to, to retrieve the ball. And, um, and this one here looks a little bit curious, a sort of sprint out to the touchline. To look into that in a little bit more detail, I decided to make a movie. And so if I just get this playing, you can clearly see that the uh, player 10 is running down back towards the touchline to try and print the ball from going out of play and retrieve possession, uh, retain possession, which is what he does. So today we dived a little bit deeper into the tracking data, focusing on player motion, measuring player velocities, and calculating simple summary statistics for a player's physical performance throughout a match. In the next installment, William Spearman is going to present some of the more advanced metrics that he has worked on for analyzing um, game situations, focusing particularly on uh, pitch control models. And then in the following session, I'm going to, to walk through how you can build your own pitch control model in Python using some of the tools that we've developed to this point. So finally, I'm just going to leave you with uh, a little bit of homework. There are two tasks here. In the first, see if you can develop a method for estimating the top speed of each player in the, the data samples that we've made available. And of course, one of the things to consider here is that a player might not actually reach his or her top speed in a game. So how could we estimate it based on the data that we have in hand? Um, the second task is to, to measure player acceleration from the tracking data and similarly to, to estimate the maximum rate of acceleration for each player. And these are quantities that we could then plug into our pitch control model in the, in the next hands-on session.